following program is a peer-to-peer -peer advice show and does not diagnose mental health conditions. If you're seeking social services, please call or text 211 or go to 211.ca. Hello, listeners around the world on radio, streaming, and podcast services. This is It's Not Therapy. I'm Leanna Kersner, and I am not a therapist, but I am your source for navigating the madness of mental health using my top 10 sayings for checking in with your best self. This episode, we're going to stop making excuses. Joining me tonight is Denise Lee, life and business coach, incest survivor, recovering addict, and as she puts it, recovering people pleaser. And yeah, off the top, I said incest survivor. But unlike some other shows, we're not going to sensationalize that. Denise is coming on because, well, you're going to be hard pressed to have more reasons for mental health struggles than her. But Denise is big on accountability. And if she can stop making excuses, anyone can. Now, this topic has a tendency to touch nerves. This is also a topic I feel very strongly about based on my own personal journey. So some things may be triggering this episode. Please don't feel like you have to sit in silence. If anything inspires a question, comment, or suggestion, fill out the contact form, nottherapyshow.com. You can email me, Leanna at nottherapyshow.com. When you're at nottherapyshow.com, you can join our mailing list or... You can reach out, Not Therapy Show, on Twitter, Instagram, and now Threads. Yes, I am one of those hundred million people who join Threads. Okay, so we all make excuses sometimes. We're human, right? Nobody is perfectly self-aware or flawlessly responsible. But we can all work to catch ourselves when we make excuses instead of really focusing on the reasons we procrastinate, avoid, talk ourselves out of doing the work to meet our goals. My top 10 phrases are for me an excuse reduction bonanza. I'm going to focus on the first of them tonight. Don't let problems that aren't your fault lead to mistakes that are. Your traumatic childhood is not a death sentence. Your divorce does not mean all men are terrible. That person who was mean to you in high school is not representative of their entire race, religion, gender, or anything else. Hurt people hurt people. But being hurt is not an excuse to hurt people. Being hurt is a part of life. But so many people feel guilt and shame about letting people hurt them. And here's the thing. No one's omnipotent. It happens. And beating ourselves up over getting hurt, well, it just makes the hurt worse. If someone breaks your trust, that's on them. On the other hand, if someone communicated needs and you made excuses instead of doing what you could to make the relationship work, that's on you. When I was a kid, back in the day, in the 80s, there was this catchphrase for when us kids complained about anything about our lives. We'd get, they're starving children in Africa, as if the African famine had any impact on parents not meeting their children's emotional needs in Canada. They're starving children in Africa, as if Africa was a single place and not an entire continent, was an excuse parents used to not listen to their children. And we hear that sort of, I call false humanitarian gaslighting a lot, but it's been in the celebrity news lately in a very tea-spilling way surrounding, you may know of the actor and producer Jonah Hill. Jonah Hill got recently put on blast by an ex-girlfriend named Sarah Brady. Sarah Brady shared messages that Jonah Hill sent her before they broke up in 2022. 
Now, Sarah Brady, the ex-girlfriend, is a professional surfer. And Jonah Hill apparently sent her messages using the language of boundaries to make this laundry list of demands, including that this professional surfer stop surfing with men and being photographed in bathing suits. That That's right. I did say he wanted a professional surfer to not post pictures of herself in a bathing suit. And he insisted that this was about his boundaries. Now, this would be kind of hilarious if there weren't a bunch of people going, what's wrong with that? That's, yes, he has the right, he's, she's his girlfriend, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Those aren't boundaries. Top 10 phrase. Others don't have to like your boundaries, but they do have to respect them. And Jonah Hill's demands didn't respect Sarah Brady's boundaries in that she has a job with requirements. She shouldn't have to quit to make a relationship work because he's insecure. A boundary is a healthy limit a person sets for themselves. Like, for instance, a healthy boundary can be, I'm not going to date surfers because I can't handle photos of my girlfriend in a bathing suit. What Jonah Hill did was not set a boundary. What Jonah Hill did was made demands that, like I said, violate his ex-girlfriend's boundaries. I'm going to beat this to death. She's a surfer. Bathing suits are a professional requirement. Because this isn't the first time Jonah Hill used mental health language, therapy language, misused it to avoid adulting. Again, Jonah Hill is an actor and producer. You may have seen him in Moneyball. I think he was in The Wolf of Wall Street. He's, He's that guy. Promoting projects by doing media appearances is a part of the job of being an actor. But Jonah Hill, last year, refused to do any promo for not just a documentary he was doing on mental health, but a Kenya Barris project as well. And he claimed he wasn't doing it because he had an anxiety condition. Now, what's wrong with that? Well, put yourself in his place. Imagine you showed up at work one day and told your boss that you just weren't doing a major job requirement because of a mental health condition. Wouldn't go over too well, would it? You can't just pick which parts of a job you're going to do in a given month. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not making light of anxiety disorders. Anxiety disorders are extremely serious. You can't just push through anxiety. You can't. I want to make that clear. I'm not saying Jonah Hill just should have sucked it up buttercup. What I am saying is a guy with Jonah Hill's resources. A guy with those resources can treat the anxiety disorder. He has access to the tools and the supports and the medication and, 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 and he can just stop working for a while if he can't do the job. Instead, he made excuses to skip out on the most stressful part of being in the entertainment industry. I do interviews for a living. I also have to be the subject of interviews sometimes for a living. Everyone is anxious dealing with the press. There's a tiny thing in the back of your head going, say or do one little thing wrong, nightmare scenario, right? We all know about cancellations. We've all seen little comments blow up. But it's a requirement of this job, which is why I'm always very appreciative when people, especially regular people like like Denise, come on and take that risk. Now, uh, some entertainers do reduced promotional interviews if they're getting burned out. 
that's within the realm of responsible. That can be adjusted. But doing none? That's requiring an unrealistic, unhealthy amount of control. And that's when it starts looking less like anxiety and more like an excuse. Made that statement that he wasn't too impressed anymore for the foreseeable future. He claimed in his statement that he'd suffered from anxiety attacks for 20 years. You'd think, again, with his money and his resources and his ability to drop in, drop out of that business, you'd think after 20 years and two Oscar nominations, he'd have begun to get his ish together. But Jonah Hill fell into that mental health trap of the rich and famous. He probably paid a lot of money to learn how to make excuses instead of getting well. Because there are a lot of people surrounding the entertainment industry who are more than happy to take people's money to blow smoke up their keister. And the excuses in the short term are a lot easier than doing the work. Now, since Jonah Hill is a father, he better turn it around for the sake of his kid. No more excuses. You're a parent now, Jonah Hill. But a lot of people don't. A lot of people keep making excuses. Making excuses becomes an intergenerational learned habit in families to the point that something as glaringly ridiculous as telling your surfer girlfriend that she can't take pictures of herself in a bathing suit and stay your girlfriend. A habitual excuse maker like a Jonah Hill can convince himself that that makes sense. Now, again, touchy subject. If anything inspires a question, comment, or suggestion, Leanna at Not Therapy Show is my email. Or you can go to the website, nottherapyshow.com, join our mailing list, fill out the contact form, or social media, Twitter for now, Instagram, and now threads, at Not Therapy Show. Now we're going to go to a break. When we come back, since I've used well-known examples of famous people, I'm going to introduce you to a regular person who stopped making excuses and turned her life around. Business and life coach, incest survivor, and recovering addict Denise Lee will join me for a very honest interview about how she does the work and doesn't make excuses. After this break on It's Not Therapy. The following program is a peer-to-peer advice show and does not diagnose mental health conditions. If you're seeking social services, please call or text 211 or go to 211.ca. We're back on It's Not Therapy and it's time for the interview. And this episode, I've got Denise Lee with me. Denise is a life coach, a business coach. Uh, She's an incest survivor, recovering addict, and recovering people pleaser. And uh, I met Denise on Twitter, really liked what she had to say about accountability. But obviously, Denise, your personal story gets people sitting up and taking notice. So let's begin there. What do you want people to know to start well, thank you so much, Liana, for having me. I know that you've probably got a whole bunch of people banging your door asking uh, for your time. So I really appreciate this um, moment that we're having together. So to answer your question, I don't really know where to start. I think mm-hmm. that if I had to describe my life, it would just be a very convoluted tale of something out of the young, the restless, and as the world turns. I don't really know where to begin with it. But I, I guess the, the the best place to start is just like all people who have dealt with addiction issues or any type of traumatic incidents, it always starts unassuming because for me, I never really challenged the pain and the abuse until I got out of it. So that all being said, I am a, a child of immigrants uh, from Sierra Leone. It's part of West Africa uh, near the coast for those uh, on the West coast, for those who are inquiring where on the map is Sierra Leone. And anyway, uh, I, from all parts, from looking outside in, it looked like great. We were living in an upper middle class environment. My father is an investment, but actually he's not retired, but at the time he was an investment banker. My mother was a stay at home uh, wife and 
we were living in, in a very nice neighborhood. And so if you look from the outside in, everything was fine. I had two older brothers, seven and nine years respected. But inside it was a house of horror, it was a ho house of terror. And the reason behind that was because I was raised by two deeply immature and emotionally disabled adults. My father was a unrepentant womanizer who when he wasn't at the office, he was frequently having affairs. And my mother, because she felt so devoid of love and support and care, literally sucked all the energy upon me and my, my brothers. She did what she could with my brothers, and but she used me emotionally, verbally, and yes, sometimes sexually. So your mother was the abuser. The everybody was the abuser, oh, okay. but just in different ways. And, okay. Um, okay. Yes. So it was it was the textbook addiction is a family issue uh, setup. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I think people don't understand about uh, abuse is everyone just thinks abuse is specifically just you know, the classic verbal, physical, and obviously you've heard of sexual, but mm -hmm. there's other types of abuse. There's mm -hmm. the abuse of neglect. There's mm -hmm. the abuse of abandonment. Um, and then obviously being exposed to um, inappropriate things, enmeshment, where mm -hmm. mom or dad are sharing things that a kid shouldn't know about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, what, what hit the hardest? What lasted longest for you? in terms of uh, the the after effects of abuse? Or is it too hard to separate the different kinds? I, I think it's too hard. I mean, I've, I've done a lot of inner work, I've lot of, a lot of uh, personal development, understanding okay. of myself, but I would say that when you have been raised to believe that you're only as good as what you can provide other people, mm -hmm. it really distorts your idea of who you are and your boundaries and your rights as a human being. And so it's a perfect setup for wanting to indulge in substances or people or all sorts of stuff. Yeah, that is absolutely true without an inner sense of self-worth. I mean, that that's for for the people that are not, you know, um, biologically addicted or chemically addicted. It's the numbing that comes from addiction. That seems to be the core of it. I mean, a lot of addiction recovery programs are focused on inner worth and for for that reason now with your your brothers are were they were they similarly abused or were you singled out because you were the only girl that's a really good question and as i think about it i mean my brothers were I mean, almost a generation separation nine and ten mm -hmm. nine and ten years and i think for them they quickly knew how to get out of the house. Okay. And even though they were both subject to verbal abuse and, 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 and starvation, like my, my mother would actually use starvation tactics to get them in line. Once they figure out how to be a little bit more self-sufficient, they got out of the house as soon as they could. Now, did this seem normal growing up? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, that, that's something I think people don't understand that you don't know it's not normal until you start doing the healing work. And then that's, I mean, that's pretty destabilizing when you get a, or did you find that? I mean, it, with other people I've worked with, the idea of being an abuse victim before they start feeling like a survivor is really destabilizing. Did you go through that? Well, I'll, I'll say it in another way. I, I'll never forget when growing up, when I had, you know, interacting with peers my own age. And I remember kind of sharing with a friend of mine that, yeah, here's some pornography that I, I saw from my brother's stash. And I remember the look of just complete like bewilderment and just awkwardness. And I remember just candidly showing it because it was all over the house in my house. Mm -hmm. Don't you have porn at your house? And so there was little hints throughout my, my childhood and my early adulthood that the way I was raised in my home was not healthy nor normal. Mm -hmm. But no one outright said, hey, this is crazy, Denise, because yeah. I had no one to challenge my thought process. Right. And did, um, was it, was it set up 
to you that no, this isn't what other people do, but our way is superior? Or how did the household ha- handle the fact that this is not, you said it's not normal? So I, I want to hit on a point for those mm-hmm. who are listening. Uh, if if they haven't been in a family that deeply dysfunctional and traumatic, mm-hmm. that in order to protect yourself, the family unit, there has to be this us versus them situation. So in order to maintain the the the, the cohesion of mm-hmm. each family member, everybody has to agree that even though it's crazy, we're not going to question it so that we can keep the balls in the air. And to me, when I think and reflect about my behavior and the behavior of all of my family members, everybody was so s- stuck in survival mode, trying to get mm-hmm. their own emotional needs met. Nothing was even being questioned. And everybody was just keep your head down, go forward, don't think about it. Absolutely. Now, was there some intergenerational trauma at play? You know, I I don't really know because for as most addicts or people who have gone through these type of traumatic situations it's pretty numb and uh, I shouldn't I should say numb I should pretty mum or quiet about what happened so mm-hmm. I don't really know per se what my mother went through uh, I know that she was one of like 13 uh, the only girl in like 13 siblings Oof. and my 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 grandfather on my mother's side died pretty young and it was just my my grandmother raising all those kids by herself so i don't know what really happened Mm -hmm. i do know that my grandmother on my mother's side also used starvation tactics to get the boys in line Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and as far as my father's side i really don't know i think my father just grew up with a silver spoon in his mouth and just wanted to be uh, just taken care of uh sexually and emotionally and didn't really want the responsibilities of being a, a responsible man uh, there's no other way I can explain it now th- that element of your story mm-hmm. I think is something a lot of people can relate to how do you be an adult when you had no example growing up i mean it it sounds like the typical sort of push pull chaos rigid order you know textbook case of overcompensation and codependency so how did your journey towards real accountability and self-ownership begin oh (laughs) i gotta condense my answer because i I know that we are short on time but I'll just say this, though, uh, when the uh, child support, uh, uh, it was reported that my mother um, was 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 more or less raping me and I was briefly put in foster care. I began the process of going through therapy for many, many years, and it wasn't until I was about mm, 24, 25. And bear in mind, I was used to going to therapy and just, you know, dumping everything yeah uh, trauma on dumping would listen. yeah yeah <laughs> and and I think one moment really hit me I'll never forget this where my then a therapist gave me a test unbeknownst to me it was a test for uh to see if I was addicted to sex I got an eight out of ten if I was in school I would have been awesome it would have been awesome like I'm almost a passing score and wow. the only two things I said no to was am I attracted or have I ever had sex with kids no and then the last one is had my lifestyle could have gotten me in trouble with the law and I said no but when I think about the things I did it, yeah I, I could have gone arrested so I I'm I'm allow me to kind of really tease out the story because I really want to make this point mm-hmm. drive this point home for those who are listening and at that moment after I scored an eight out of ten the therapist said you are a sex addict and I and she said, I don't know how to handle you. Here's mm-hmm. a pamphlet to go to SA, Sexaholics Anonymous, which is the, for those who don't know, within AA Alcoholic Anonymous, there's many spinoffs, not now and on coda. Mm-hmm. But Sexaholic Anonymous is still based on the same 12 step process. Go here. And that's where my healing journey really began, where I was forced to talk about all those painful memories with other people who also experienced the same, if not worse. Mm -hmm. And instead of just sharing what was on my mind, which is awesome to some extent, 
addicts are addicted to pain. They're addicted to displeasure. They, it gives them a high. And so instead of getting addicted to that high of my own norepinephrine and all my cortisol, all my stress hormones, it gave me the chance to stop and ask myself, okay, that's awesome that you're addicted to pain and displeasure. What have you learned from that? That was that turning point. All right. And we'll get to that after the break. Stay tuned for more with Denise Lee, incest survivor, recovering addict, recovering people pleaser and business and life coach. When we come back, questions, comments, not therapy show.com. Stay with us more with Denise after the break. Stay tuned. The following program is a peer-to-peer advice show and does not diagnose mental health conditions. If you're seeking social services, please call or text 211 or go to 211.ca. We're back on It's Not Therapy. I'm still Leanna Kersner. I'm still not a therapist. We're still in the interview. I'm still talking to Denise Lee, incest survivor, recovering addict, business and life coach. And before the break, Denise was talking about the moment she turned her life around. Finally having to confront stuff. That's got to be tough because all that stuff you're running from then crashes right into you. Oh, yeah. There's never a point where you're ever going to be cured. And I, I want to really drive this point home for those who are listening that if regardless of where you are in your recovery journey, there's going to come a point where there's going to be different things that set you off. And for addicts, mm-hmm. the most the most potent drug of all the addictions, doesn't mean if it's booze or alcohol or sex or whatever, is anger. That's what fuels an addict. The suppressed anger? Not necessarily suppressed. Okay. Uh, for for example, I mean, there's there addicts have a <laughs> addicts are a special class of people. We have an inferiority complex. Yeah. We have a a, a a a sense of grandiosity. We have a sense of wanting things our way, and the reason why we don't get things our way is because we couldn't control things, and right. in order to control things, we got to suppress that displeasure, and then we use. Right. Right. That that control is even people who are classified as addicts. I, we have an epidemic of needing too much control. And that that was something I learned with PTSD therapy, that in order to feel it's so counterintuitive in order to feel feel more in control, you have to be OK with not being able to control a lot of things. And that, I mean, it's the process of taking everything you assume about the world, chucking it out and building up from scratch. And mm-hmm. boundaries are, you You think you, I'm speaking, you know, universal second person. You think you have boundaries. And then you start realizing how much you're people pleasing. And the cycle of, People pleasing self harm, people pleasing self harm because you're getting that increasing deficit in your own emotional needs because you think you think you're being nice when you're people pleasing, but what you're actually doing is trying to control the world. Is that a statement that you connect to at all? I'm going to answer your question with a statement. If you, if I don't, yeah, mind. go for it. What one of the books that I received in the early years of my recovery book was and. It, Go, you can get on Amazon. For those mm-hmm. of you guys listening, it's just, <laughs> get it on Kindle. It's called I'm Okay, You're Okay. It's from the, the founder of a transactional analysis, Eric Burns. Mm. And in that, have you heard of that book? Yeah. Yeah. I'm Okay, You're Okay. So yeah. for those who don't know, one of the things that fuels addiction is this need to want to have things go along the way we want. And the reason why is because we never felt in control to begin with. So we try to make the world a better place on our paradigm. Mm -hmm. And the book kind of dives in into a lot about understanding how when you're not okay, you're going to attract people who are also feeling not okay. And then it kind of just dives into just a big ball of insanity and confusion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And everything just seems to be happening and there's no anchor anywhere. It's just wall to wall drama. And it sometimes it feels like really close bonds, but they're trauma bonds. They're toxic, right? I mean, that that book's from the 60s, isn't it? 
Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's uh, as you kind of dig more into transactional analysis, that's really what helped me heal from my addiction issues or helping me heal. I can't say that I'm completely mm-hmm. healed and understanding that when I'm indulging in my anger, I'm only fueling my addiction. Right now. I mean, you have legitimate reason to be angry. <laughs> so how do you separate the, mm-hmm. the idea of you can be angry and not explode and be destructive, right? How did you start separating those that, that you can be angry, you can feel anger, but it doesn't consume you? That's a work in process, mm-hmm. you know, a, that I don't think you're ever going to be completely healed from the idea that Okay, let's just say it another way. If you have been trained from a very early age, before the age of third, in a very painful, destructive environment, you are literally biochemically addicted to norepinephrine. You know, we've all heard about dopamine, like, mm-hmm. yay, uppers, right? Serotonin is like a mood sailor, but norepinephrine is a pain chemical. Mm-hmm. It activates stress results. So it is a, if you're, you know how a little kid gets used to like drinking milk from the bottle? Well, right. for us addicts, we've been, you know, sipping from the tap of anger (laughs) since Mm -hmm. day one. Mm -hmm. And so this idea of, am I really in control? It's more about uh, respecting and understanding that I'm preconditioned to want to feel angered because I was wired that way. Mm -hmm. But now I have the choice to see all my options. And sometimes it's okay to feel anger. We need, for a lot of us who have been abused or neglected or mistreated, we've done a great job of ignoring our anger. Mm -hmm. But now it's different. So it's not so much of, I'm not going to ignore my anger. I'm going to ask myself, what is my anger signaling to me right Mm -hmm. now? What's the most appropriate choice? Right, right. So you just slow it down, fight that. Because I mean, norepinephrine is the body's fight or flight response. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and like you said, when you're, when you have adverse childhood experiences, one of those lovely, you know, psychiatric industry, soft terms for something really hard. When you have adverse childhood experiences, you're, you're in constant fight or flight mode or more accurately freeze fight, fawn or flight. And yeah, yeah, you can retrain that. But like you said, it takes work and it's a lifelong thing. And it's really easy to slip back in to those battled behaviors because they feel normal now use using the language of i'm okay you're okay that that was mm-hmm. one of those books that was my first one of my first encounters with the problems with um you know they talk about the ego state there which is very freudian terminology but the idea of the stories we tell ourselves about what's going on i believe they call them dictations in Mm. in that book but the idea that we have these scripts in our head of something is um you know disgusting or wonderful or it focuses on the word should as Mm. as whether something should be something or shouldn't be something can be a real mind trap because it stops us from one seeing reality to making decisions for ourselves about what's right for us. How, based on your background, did you create those boundaries and that system of ethics, for lack of a better term? Okay, so I'm a big fan of empowerment. So for those Uh of you guys listening, I hope you get a pen, a paper out or something to jot down because I want to clarify a couple of things Uh and answer your question, obviously. Uh, I I misspoke earlier when I said uh, games people play by uh, Dr. Eric Burns. It was it's games people play. The I'm okay, you're okay book was from his protege, Tom Harris. Yeah. And the scripts people uh, play book is uh, from Claude Steiner. And so all those books kind of tie into what we're talking about, this idea of the messages that we're saying, who's saying them, and why are we why are we being exposed to that? Why are we being triggered in that moment? Mm-hmm. And so I don't I, again, I, I, I'm a I, I always tell my clients I'm a your unlicensed therapist and mm-hmm. uncredentialed therapist. Uh, 
transactional analysis because I really rely deeply on that material to help people understand their ego states, meaning that yeah. there's three people within our heads that the uh, the parent that mm-hmm. says the shoulds and the shouldn'ts you you right. shouldn't have that next drink of alcohol you should just go ahead and just drink some water or the little kid saying yeah but <laughs> and then the rational adult that says well I don't know if we can but there's nobody who can watch us so let's mm-hmm. go ahead so we have all these little voices playing in our heads and addicts they're only just listening to dysfunctional mouth scripted things from a mashup from their kid, their inner mm-hmm. kid or from their parent. And in order to get present, to understand what's going on, you have to silence those voices enough so that you can be able to hear the rational adult speaking to you and saying, OK, right now, is this going to help my future self? So that's one of the questions that I always tell my clients is like, what's your future self, your healthy future self telling you that you should be doing right now? Now, how do everybody's practice is different in those Mm -hmm. silencing, you know, the voices that aren't good for you. How Mm -hmm. do you do it? You know, for for a lot of people, it's instantly like they they've 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 been in the practice for a a long period Mm -hmm. of time. And I would say I would say for me in the beginning of my I want to explain your what I do now, mm-hmm. but I also want to explain what I did in the beginning because right. I know that people will maybe listening and be like, well, that's awesome, Denise. You've been doing this for a while, but exactly. what about me? Yeah. In the yeah, beginning yeah. of my journey, I had uh, my first sponsor gave me a little a little fidget toy. She said, every time you feel like you want to use, hold on to this, grab this fidget toy. Right. Or 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 I or, or literally to say the mantra I am powerless over this feeling of or pray over the person or pray over the thing or not pray over your liquor but pray over yes. if you're feeling anger to, towards someone like like send love and kindness mm-hmm. and that kind of immediately withdraws the tendency to want to indulge in either the anger or the confusion and now for me one of the things that have helped me is my prep work. And for me, it's a huge practice of doing my spiritual grounding work before I even like talk to anybody. And so for me, everybody does it differently. But for me, that's the moment where I'm in prayer, I'm in meditation. It's where I do my breath work. It's where I settle in to the earth and really understand like where I am emotionally and physically Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. before I even interact with people. So that when those moments of tension happen, I'm more fully present. When you're in the midst of an, your addiction issues, you're everywhere but reality. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great way of putting it. And yeah, that that one of the things that gets missed a lot when we talk about resilience is that self-care, getting enough sleep, eating decent food, exercising, all that stuff. Um, it's important because what if we're, like you said, grounded, centered, mm-hmm breathing we can make choices the minute we get overextended that that rational task oriented part of the brain you know gets amygdala hijacked and all of a sudden we're in that you know the spiral of the world seeming so big and everything we seem so small and we're not worth it so why not abuse ourselves right Mm. so That so that you have a preparation ritual that you do before you go out out into the world, and and that helps you. I mean, forget even go out the world before I interact with my family. Oh, okay. (laughs) The war zone doesn't even start like when I I I, I open my computer. The war zone starts when I start interacting with human beings. So this is like first thing in the morning you do it. Yes. Oh, that's great. And and I roll out of bed and I get straight into my routine. Yeah, the fidget toy, it seems like such a simple thing. And people are like, how does that work? But the way it works is you're focusing on something instead of that mind wandering default mode network um, in the brain, you know, stabbing you with knives on the inside. So mm. it, you so you find now, and I think it's important to hear you say it because I say it, but it's good for someone else. You find it more automatic now because you've been doing it so long this is your normal now this is my normal now now don't get me wrong like i I, 
right now as we're speaking, I'm I have my own little toy. I have a little yeah. I have a little crucifix and it's in my pocket. I'm I touch it every once in a while. And it's more to help myself, remind myself to put prioritize my faith over my fear. Okay. And that is for me what helps me feel grounded in moments of stress or mm-hmm. feeling a little awkward or discomfort. Like I for those who are who are listening, this is my first time being interviewed on this particular kind of subject. Oh wow. And so I want to feel grounded and safe and secure. So wow. I just don't want people thinking that, oh well, you've been doing this for seven years. You know what you're talking about. Like, well, I'm still exposed to new and scary things just like everybody yeah. else. Yeah. And every so often sometimes it can seem to come out of nowhere the stuff just creeps back and you have to go back to square one well not quite square one but you have to reset and rebuild and get back grounded um and that's I think that's the exhausting part of the whole process because like you said off the top you're never cured but I think people people think that sounds hopeless and it's not because it's not a question of being cured it's a question of being better right like you don't want to go back to what it was like before so you have to have a new normal you know i i like to reframe this idea of exhaustion i would Mm -hmm. think of it as humbling and i think of it as a growing opportunity because hadn't i not been able to be blessed with this personal development program, enhanced mm-hmm. personal development program, I would not have the tools and the communication mm-hmm. skills that I have now. I would not have an, any interest in reading all the many psychology and psychiatric mm-hmm. books and self-help books. I would have never been interested in stoicism. I would have never been interested in migrating away from hedonism to stoicism. I would have never been interested had it not been being blessed with the opportunity to heal my heart in a deeper way. All right. I'm a fan of the Stoics too. So I'm going to do a completely selfish question. Who's your favorite yeah. Stoic philosopher? Who's not Marcus Aurelius? <laughs> you know, uh, I know, right. That everyone's a Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius sorry, yeah. 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 Well, you know, believe it or not. And I think a lot of people don't give him credit for this. It was uh, Napoleon Hill. Ooh. You know, for those who don't know about Napoleon Hill, everyone knows about him when he says the what think and grow rich, right? Yeah. Yeah. But he's read a lot of other, he's written a lot of other books. And one of the other books that I really captivated me was Outthinking the Devil by okay. Napoleon Hill. Awesome. And I'm not going to tease too much about that book because I think it's worth reading it. Right, right. But but I'll say for those who are listening, the, the devil is you. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you need to get out of your own way great place to stop denise lee life and business coach uh survivor um in recovery denise for people who like what they hear want to find out more about you maybe want to get in touch with you as Mm -hmm. a coach how how can people uh, find out more about you okay well there's tons of places where you can find me i am most active i'm most gabbing and talking on twitter so you can find me at denise g like the letter G, mm-hmm. like Lee dot com, um, Lee <laughs> at Twitter. So Denise G Lee, and then obviously my website is Denise G Lee dot com, and I'm I always love answering questions. So you can just tag me in a tweet, or uh, you can read one of my many articles and just have at it. You know. <laughs> yeah. That. That's oh, oh, also, also one more thing, and obviously I have my own podcast. You can find me at the Introverted Entrepreneur Podcast, and then via my main website, you can get connected to that. Awesome. Denise, thanks so much. I can't believe this is your first media interview of this format. It'd be great. (laughs) Thank you. When we come back, final thoughts. Only a few minutes left on It's Not Therapy, but I want to recap after the break. More things you can do to stop making excuses like Denise did back in a bit. The following program is a peer-to-peer advice show and does not diagnose mental health conditions. If you're seeking social services, please call or text 211 or go to 211.ca. We're back in It's Not Therapy, closing minutes of this episode of It's Not Therapy, talking stop making excuses. And I want to draw attention to two more of my top 10 phrases because they are at the core of that control and suppression 
that leads to those excuses that Denise and I were talking about before the break. And I'm still blown away by Denise. Like, wow, to share those elements of your life as part of recovery, but also, you know, to provide information for other people to make their journeys, their healing easier, uh, recovery easier. That That's why a lot of us get up in the morning. Uh, awesome. And that is where I'm going to start. When you're recovering from this stuff, you have to give up the idea of perfection. Top 10 phrase, stop trying to be perfect. Perfect is a lie. All that shame, all that guilt you're carrying around, it's gotta go because it's never gonna be enough. And when you start working with enough, feeling like enough, you can stop making excuses because you can say, I'm not feeling up to going out today. I just don't have the spoons. I don't have the energy tonight. Get me next time. To me, that is so much better than coming up with a lie, making an excuse because somebody like me, I know it's BS and I don't know why. I don't know, especially if I don't know somebody that well. I don't know if it's me, if they just don't want to deal with me because I'm a lot sometimes or there's something going on. If something's going on, an authentic person like me wants authenticity from other people. I will understand, and I get not everybody does, but that's where you get to top 10 phrase. You are the hero of your own story and not anyone else's. People that can't accept you for who you are aren't worth your excuses. And I know that's easy to say with me you know, coming out the other side of this stuff, but it's true. And I'm going to keep saying it because... That was the hardest thing for me to accept. Some people gotta go. Because at the end of the day, another top 10 phrase. Self-esteem cannot exist without self-compassion. And that's the one weird trick. That's the counterintuitive at first part. Making excuses ends when you can be compassionate with yourself. Because if you're understanding of yourself, people who aren't understanding of you are going to read very differently to you. And it's going to be much easier to deal with that sort of rejection or that lack of understanding. Ultimately, at the end of the day, the only person an excuse really hurts is you and you're worth better than those excuses you're worth better than the workarounds you're like worth better than making a butt face out of yourself the way jonah hill did and that can be the hardest thing to embrace and i gotta embrace time limits leave it there more next week and as usual sign off you're crazy is only a problem if it's hurting you.